thank you. Um, firstly, thank you to the Monetary Authority and to the Central Bank of Kenya uh, for having me here. Um, and to share my thoughts about the state of the world, the future of the world, uh, the role of fintech in that world, and I think most importantly, the opportunity uh, for Africa in that world. Um, so the funny thing about my talk is it has very little to do with technology. And I know I'm at a fintech conference, I get that. Uh, it has a lot to do with humanity. And one of the things I know about all of you, because you're human, is that 98% of you won't actually remember 98% of what I'm about to say. And I actually know that from my own personal experience because I came to the conference yesterday and last night in the middle of the night with jet lag, I'm like lying in bed trying to like sort out what, what happened yesterday. And I was thinking about all the, all the talks I heard and incredibly compelling talks and I was trying to sort of capture well, what did I remember from that? What is my takeaway? What is, and what is the application of my takeaway? And I just realized, like, that's, humans aren't really good at this. And so I'm going to help you by giving you the 2% of what I'm about to say over the next 20 minutes, the, the 2% that I think really matters. And it comes in two parts. So the first percent, the first 1%, is that whatever you are trying to do, steer a country in today's 21st century, tech-centric world, figure out what digital transformation means, figure out what blockchain means, figure out how to grow your business, figure out how to turn your startup into a viable business, that whatever you are trying to figure out, my suggestion to you is to spend less time focusing on the technology questions and more time focusing on the human questions. And the irony of our existence is that all we have is our humanity, and yet we tend to take it for granted. We tend to not spend much time contemplating who we are, why we are, what we do, why we don't do what we should do. And in that regard, we kind of, not only do we miss the point, but we miss the opportunity. And in the case of innovation, we suffer the risk of failure. And to prove my point, 75% of all startups fail. And I actually was reading an article yesterday that suggested it was more like 90%. The article also suggested that in any given year, 5 million businesses are being created. So by the time I have finished speaking today, 40 new no, 200 new businesses will be created. And the vast majority of them will fail. I think 75% is underreported. The other stat, 95% of corporate innovation fails. So this is the big money, the big guns, the big brains, right? Coming up with new product ideas to extend their portfolio, whatever, and 95% of the time, they fail. And then the third one, 84% of digital transformation fails. In the United States last year, this is crazy. In the United States last year, 1.3 trillion dollars, <laughs> reported in Forbes, so it must be real, $1.3 trillion was spent on digital transformation, and they determined through some extensive research study that $900 billion was a waste of money. So just like, hold on to that for a second. So this presumption, this delusion that we have that everything is going to work out just fine and all these technologies are going to somehow find their place and all these startups are going to make it is not fundamentally true. But the miss in it is not, to my mind, around technology. The technology works. The failure rate is a function of connecting the technology with the truth of humanity. And that is a function of us not contemplating the truth of ourselves and the truth of the people we serve. There's a cheat sheet. Virtually every presentation I give, at some point in my, in my slide deck, this thing appears. How many people know Maslow? Okay, for those that did not raise their hand, please Google it later. So Maslow was this psychologist in the 50s named Abraham Maslow, and he studied human behavior his entire career, and he arrived at this construct. And his simple view is that every decision we make 
Every, every behavior we have, how we look at the world, how we look at our existence, it's all through these filters, these, this hierarchy of needs, and it's, it goes bottom up. So as we are contemplating something new, as we are contemplating adopting an innovation, we come from a place of a need for physiological need and safety need. That is how we look at the world. That is how we engage the rest of the world, is through these fundamental needs. And to prove my point, and you've already done it a little bit today, I want you all to turn around and introduce yourself to the person behind you. Come on. Okay, Okay. so I'm betting some percentage of you, when I asked you to do that, felt a little pitter-patter in your heart, a little bit of fear, like, oh my God, I'm now going to expose myself to a stranger, and the stranger might not like me, or in our primal way, the stranger might actually hurt me. So what's funny about that little moment is your customer or your citizens, in the case of you that run countries, they feel the same way. The Maslowian hierarchy of a need applies to every human being walking the earth. And so if you want to be successful with innovation, understand that hierarchy, understand the motivators, understand the behaviors, and meet the human where the human is. You know what this is. It was talked about a lot yesterday. Is the success of M-Pesa technology, is, that, is there AI in that thing? Is there ML in that thing? Is there blockchain? Stop, do they use blockchain to make that happen? Ah, the success of M-Pesa is it meets humans where they are. The area of greatest learning opportunity in our lives is the area that we think we already know, and that is the area of being human. Like, nobody in this room has thought about being human in the last 24 hours. Nobody's thought about their customers as being human. Nobody's thought about the future of humanity. We're all fixated on the shiny objects and I, what I think of as the superficiality of things like technology. I'm pro-technology, but I really think it only works when you put it through the lens of the human. Hold on, I'm going to switch here. The second point, remember I promised you 2%, 1% is all about humanity, understanding humanity. The second point is the idea of as we go forward, we fixate on going forward. And I, I think there's an irony, which is there's a lot to learn by going backwards. And I don't, I don't mean going backwards in terms of learning the ways of the West or the East. I mean learning backwards and turning in terms of understanding what has happened since the beginning of civilization. The fact of the matter is, over the last 3,000 years, many empires have risen and many have fallen. Many. And so the question is, what can we learn about the rise and what can we learn about the fall so that we can actually avoid the fall? The problem with this is we don't do this, right? <laughs> we don't do this. George Hagel, who was a 19th century philosopher, said this. We learn from history that we do not learn from history. So there's a, there's a sort of corollary that goes with this, which is the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. There's a lot to learn from history. Now the good news is, just like Maslow is a cheat sheet on our humanity, there's a guy named John Glubb. Also, around the 1950s, British guy, kind of a warrior philosopher dude, um, and he ended up studying empires, and that was his thing. And he, he ended up realizing that every empire since the beginning of time, Assyrian, Mongolian, Persian, doesn't matter, every empire has lasted about 250 years, every one. It's quite remarkable. Everyone has risen and everyone has fallen. And he wrote this little treatise called The Fate of Empires. And in it, my view is a prescription on both how to rise and how not to fall. 
every empire, every nation state that has risen has followed the same path. And the first path or first stage is the age of pioneer. And I think of this as the age of the entrepreneur, right? That we have a shared vision, we have courage, we have a sense of duty, we have responsibility, we're all in this together, there's self-sacrifice. We're doing everything we can to move the collective forward. And the age of pioneer is followed by the age of conquest, which in the old days meant physical conquest. I think in today's world, it means virtual conquests. And if not conquests, this thing called coopetition, or just call it collaboration. Followed by the age of commerce. So things start stabilizing. The economy is doing okay. You know, a middle class emerges. Life is actually pretty good. And then the age of affluence. So in the age of affluence, money becomes the centerpiece or the center point of the majority of society's actions. And a divide emerges and inequality emerges. There's a loss of duty, there's a loss of self-sacrifice, there's a loss of us being in it together. It is literally the beginning of the end. And money becomes all. A quote from Glubb's piece, gradually and almost imperceptibly, the age of affluence silences the voice of duty. The object of the young and the ambitious is no longer fame, honor, or service, but cash. This guy wrote this in 1950. Mission becomes money, an open society becomes closed, and the entity starts fearing loss versus celebrating gain. A highly protected state. And then the end of the end ends with two other stages. The age of the intellect, where we start belly button gazing, we start thinking we've got it all figured out, we intellectualize everything, we think ration, rationality can solve any problem, and we begin to really lose touch with our humanity. And then the final stage, which is really depressing, is the age of decadence. I mean, you could argue you come out of college, you're a pioneer, and then your conquest is you seek a significant other, and then you stabilize your career, and you're now commerce, and then you do really well, and you're an affluence, and then you start thinking you got it all figured out, and that's the beginning of the end. No, you re look at the data. We are here. We are here. We are not over there. We are here. Here's some data. I won't belabor it. Healthcare costs through the roof, cost of education through the roof, student debt. Student debt in the United States is $1.3 trillion. It exceeds credit card debt. Excuse me? My other little favorite stat on this, last year $3.8 billion was spent by lobbying, lobbyists in the United States, which is like 5% of Kenya's GDP. That's our form of corruption, right there. And it keeps on going. So you say, no, 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 Chris, no, 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 you're wrong. No, 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 the United States is a superpower. No, 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 look at the Global Innovation Index. It's number six. Singapore is number five, congratulations. But I argue if you actually look at the thing on the right, you can't, you can't read it. But if you actually look at the variables that inform the Global Innovation Index, which is used increasingly by countries to say, look at us, look at us, I think they're not quite right. They focus on inputs and they focus on outputs, but I don't think they focus on the fundamental truth of a society or a country or an empire or anything. Here's my, some other stats if you don't believe me. 25% of college students in the United States are on, on antidepressant or anti-anxiety medication. 25%. 40% of Americans are obese, and based on my last time there, I think that's underreported. And then the, I think one of the worst ones is one in four Americans feel isolated, feel like they have no one to confide in. And loneliness is actually a health issue because it turns out being lonely is akin to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It's a mess. But this is the, this is the point I want to make about the rise and the fall. What motivates the fall is not externalities, it's internalities. It's actually about behavior. It's not about capital or competition. It's not about capital or competition or technology. It's about how the society loses its way in terms of why it exists and what it is trying to do. 
and how the leadership of those societies and economies manage that path. And the other point of this is you are in the catbird seat because you fundamentally, this continent, this country, this collection of countries is fundamentally pioneering. And my point to you is hold on to that forever because the attributes of a pioneer are what it takes to survive and thrive in today's world. This is my terrible PowerPoint. My point is you don't go beyond the age of pioneer. My point is for any country in the world, seek to be a pioneer. That the rate of change is such that if you are not changing constantly, if you are not exhibiting the attributes of a pioneer, of an entrepreneur, you will get left behind. Now the good news is, my view, this continent has seven attributes that line perfectly with successful entrepreneurs. Remember, I ran the Harvard Innovation Labs. I spent the last four years of my life working with thousands of entrepreneurs. And the attributes, the characteristics of Africa are the characteristics of successful entrepreneurs, successful pioneers. Give yourself a round of applause. Number one, need versus want. Need creates drive. So I had this wacky theory. Many of my theories have no data substantiation whatsoever. So here's my theory. There are only two motivators of behavior change. Need versus want. Desperation versus aspiration. That's it. The problem with aspiration is not very effective. My example is I gotta go to the doctor. I've been trying to lose weight for 10 years. I don't lose any weight, I go to the doctor. The doctor says, Chris, if you don't lose weight, you're gonna increase your risk of a heart attack. I'm gonna lose three, 10 pounds by Friday, right? I want to lose weight, so what? I need to lo lose weight, I will lose weight. So aspiration doesn't work, desperation works. Need works. And then in the case of digital transformation, the reason why most digital transformation fails is because the organizations trying to transform digitally aren't motivated by aspiration, they're not motivated by desperation, they're actually motivated because they think they should because everybody is, else is. Number two, resource constraint is actually advantage because it motivates a higher level of thinking, right? A more innovative approach. You have to be resourceful. Number three, lack of legacy infrastructure creates an open-mindedness, a willingness to try things and do things that uh, others might not. I go to mobile payments, we are laggards. The United States is behind. <laughs> We're so behind. And the reason why is because we have this legacy infrastructure and legacy culture that we're kind of stuck. Number four, you know, being an entrepreneur fundamentally is about taking risk. And one of the enablers of risk taking is if there's not a lot of downside, you're more, um, you're more willing, you're more amenable to stepping out, stepping forward, jumping off the cliff. And that's to me is an advantage. And I think this one's like a little weird, but I think it's really important. The idea of emerging is a really powerful construct. Because in emergence, you cannot help but be introspective. You cannot help but look at self and embrace the truth of self, embrace the truth of where you are because you're trying to get to a better place. When you already think you're at the top, you lose the capacity to be introspective. Again, you think you got it all figured out. And so, you know, number one attribute of a successful entrepreneur, number one, this is proven by research, is self-awareness. And you, this country, this continent has it. So the question is, how do you avoid, if you're at the top as pioneers, how do you avoid the fall? And I have three simple ideas, or maybe not so simple. I don't think the measures that exist in society are the right measures. I certainly don't think the Global Innovation Index is the right measure. I don't think GDP is the right measure. I, don't th I think this is getting closer, but I'm still not sure it's the right measure. And so I've been thinking about a new index that would help us all figure out how to get to where we want to get to without suffering the other side. And I was reading The New Yorker last week, and there's a quote, there's an interview with uh, Macron, and he said this, for society to be sustainable, you have to restore the equality of chances. And that really stuck with me. And I think that is what we're actually all after, the equality of chances. And I think ultimately what we're after is in order to self-actualize this continent, in order to self-actualize this country, 
We have to self-actualize the people. They have to be self-actualized. So shouldn't we create an index that measures actualization, right? I mean, if a country exists, consists of 100 people and 100 people are self-actualized, realizing their full potential, then de facto, that country is excelling, <laughs> I think. The second thing, and I'm going to try to wrap this up, um, I really believe if I ran a country, I would put a ton of my energy into the education system, but not just primary and secondary. I mean, here's the dynamic. We live in a world where the pace of change is faster than the average human's ability to change. Fundamentally true. And yet the systems don't exist to help adults keep up with that change. We continue to focus on K-12 and higher ed, but they don't, they don't keep up. The other thing I just want to call out, and this, this may get me thrown out of the conference, which is, I guess, okay. I think this talk about financial inclusion is, is wonderful, truly wonderful. But I worry that it's not joined with talk about financial literacy. Yeah, thank you. Like, I've been to many FinTech conferences over the last year. Thanks, Sop. Nobody ever says the words financial literacy. And do you know what happens when you put something like a credit instrument in the hands of somebody that doesn't understand credit? I saw it firsthand. I live in the United States. I saw the subprime mortgage collapse. We thought we should put mortgage, the credit instrument of mortgage in the hands of millions of Americans and they didn't actually understand the terms of the deal. And the last thing I want to say about adult learning, I don't think this is about retraining. So Amazon just, uh, just, announced, Amazon just announced on Monday that they're going to spend $700 million retraining 100,000 of their employees. So you'd look at that and say, that's good news, right? That's good news. I think it is sort of good news. I think the issue I have with it is part of that training needs to focus on skills like resiliency, right? Skills like adaptation needs to motivate people to realize that they have to be lifelong learners, that it's not incumbent on their corporation or their country to lead them every step of the way. Fundamentally, I believe every human needs to recognize that they have to be a pioneer. And then in order to be a successful pioneer, you have to learn for life. If you want FinTech to work for humanity, then spend more time worrying about humanity. And that really is the opportunity to take the advantages that are unique to this continent and then put them through a filter really of compassion for each other, for society at large, and get really good at being human. So when you go forward today, don't go forward as bankers, don't go forward as technologists, don't go forward as entrepreneurs. Go forward as humans, seeking to understand the other and in doing so, seeking to understand yourself. We are in this together. Thanks very much.